Um, our guest this evening is Scott from the Collins Collectors Association, which is a, uh, a longtime group of uh, folks who collect and restore and use Collins radios. And uh, I've been involved with the group for a, a few years, a number of years back, and I've always loved Collins equipment. And I came across the booth when I was out at Xenia, and I thought, ah, talk potential. So okay. I, uh, I introduced myself, and Scott said, give me an email. So uh, he's, going to, he's going to also return, because Collins has a long history. So what we're doing tonight is kind of like from the beginning up through the war years. And then when we invite Scott back a little bit later this year, it will be for like from the war years on through where things are in the rock wheel years and everything else. So uh, I will then turn it over. Uh, everybody, if you're not uh, doing, oh, Scott, I need to, uh, excuse me, I need to make you co-host. Oh, okay. So that you can share screen and I also will spotlight you so you're in the middle and then everybody else uh, go ahead and mute yourself and I will uh, turn it over to you. Well thank you Paul. Um, I'm Scott KE1RR. I, um, I've been president or vice president of the CCA for about a dozen years. I termed out in the fall of last year and I have to sit out for a year or two before I'm back on the board. And I have not made the decision as to whether or not I'm gonna do that. A dozen years is, it might be my limit, but I'm still a Dayton chair and an advisor to the board and uh, very involved and very active. Um, but with family and, um, you know, other commitments, uh, it's just, it's hard to take on an organization of that size. Um, we have, we, 900 to 1100 members normally. Um, we have an email reflector hosted on groups.io. And that is one of our main focuses. We have the uh, nets all across the nation. Um, highlighted by our 20 meter net at 14.263, 20 hundred Zulu every Sunday. We go across the nation uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, kind of following the gray line. Uh, and that's really how the CCA started back in the 90s. It was a net for people interested in Collins. And then they decided to gather at Dayton and then there was a banquet and then there was a newsletter uh, we have a website, www.collegeradio.org, and we probably have the largest collections of manuals and other information on Collins in existence. As a matter of fact, I was up at Cedar Rapids, and some of the engineers said, you know, if we need a manual on a whole piece of equipment, we tend to look at your website rather than trying to get a dig out a manual ourselves. So that kind of made me feel good. Um, the, uh, share my screen. Uh, to show that I'm completely nuts, I'm in a 30 by 40 uh, barn and um, I've converted it into a wood shop and my ham shack. When you walk in the front door, this is the World War II area. Um, this is a TDO right here, uh, which was pre-war and used during World War II. And then here are some of the radios used during the war. This is my shop and that empty chair is where I'm sitting now. Uh, this is my AM room, which is just ad adjacent. I've got four broadcast transmitters and two broadcast consoles and a variety of receivers appropriate to the era of the uh, broadcast transmitters I'm using. And then if you were sitting at one of those consoles, then here is an HF area of commercial equipment. Uh, and then you go up the stairs, I only have a picture of that. I have my S line and A line here. So uh, I have um, completely fallen off the slippery slope of 
collecting uh, Collins gear and enjoy it, but it is uh, a lot of work to keep running. Um, Collins Radio is um, the early years. Art Collins was born in 1909. He was born uh, to M.H. Collins and his wife, and he was born in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. He, around six years old, his father, M.H. Collins, was a banker in Oklahoma, and he decided to start a modern farming co-op using modern farming methods and move the family when Art was about six to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, and that's kind of important to the story that his father was well healed. He had some financial assets and means at that time uh, to help support um, art and his love of radio. Uh, to back up a little bit, radio had started at the turn of the century. I think we all know that story. Uh, the Radio Act of 1912. Uh, was really enacted to move the amateur radio operators away from the burgeoning military and commercial use of radio. They moved the amateur radio operators up above one and a half megahertz, which they felt really wasn't usable, and left everybody else that was uh, trying to make money or the military to play in the area below one and a half megahertz. They put the amateurs at a thousand watts or less, and they thought they would be done with it. Uh, they also required amateur radio operators to be licensed, and but then the war happened and they shut down amateur radio activity. And in 1918, they brought it back up, but uh, this did not shut down ham radio or the amateur radio operators because advances in vacuum tube technology meant that they could build receivers that were um, effective above one and a half megahertz. And um, other people got the idea that it could work and they moved ham radio operators up to the 80, 40, and 20 meter bands. Um, Art got his license at uh, 14 years old in 1923. And up at the top of his house, he uh, built a ham shack. Now, vacuum tubes and the various other components were really expensive back then. You saw the prices, they wouldn't seem, seem like they were expensive, but the dollar had a, quite a different value back in that time. And uh, this was our ham shack. It was up at the top in the attic area of the house of the family home. Art was uh, very prolific, very interested in ham radio, was a quick learner, and made a lot of friends. He was originally 9CXX, then W9CXX, and uh, then W0CXX. A friend of mine has a call sign K0CXX, and he's also a member of the group. And the one that got me um, kind of hooked on this hobby. Um, Art's shack evolved over a period of time. And of course, back then it was all Morse code and there was no uh, phone, but he was a very prolific operator and collected quite a few QSL cards. He um, kept experimenting, kept building, kept improving his shack. And his dad um, seemed to go along with it and keep funding the hobby. And over a period of time, his shack progressed from modest to um, better and better equipment. That was the family home in Cedar Rapids. And Art Shack, of course, was up at the top in the attic area. Art ran across a guy named John Reinhardt on the air. He was originally licensed JL and then 1XT. 1XAM, then 1QP when Art met him. 
Uh, John was very important in arts development and notoriety and his expertise in ham radio. Uh, John was about 12 or 14 years his senior, and he had developed what was called the Reinhardt's tuner. And it was really a shortwave receiver. That was a, uh, that's a schematic diagram of it. And that's a picture of Arts, uh, Reinhardt's tuner. They were very effective in higher frequency bands. And there was still a lot of, especially by the military, there was a lot of skepticism as to whether or not these high frequency bands could be utilized reliably. Art conned his dad into buying a van and uh, Art's in the middle in this picture, Reinhardt's is in the front. And I've forgotten who the, I think it was Paul Winslow uh, is in the back. And the three of them ran around the country uh, setting up this van to broadcast and make contacts all over the country. It was kind of the first field day uh, of the time. And you've got to remember this is in the 20s. Reinhardt's was selected for the Macmillan expedition to the North Pole to be the radio operator aboard the Bowdoin. Now, the US Navy was dying for this to be a huge success. It really wasn't, but it was built up to be by the Navy Department a bigger success than it actually was. Uh, that was, here's a picture of Richard Bird's airplane and um, the boat in. It's another picture of one of the planes on the expedition. <clears throat> and there's the boat in and there's John Reinhardt's at the controls in the boat in and they got went to the North Pole and uh, Bird flew over the North Pole, and it was widely publicized. Now, Reinhardt's was supposed to, to give daily reports uh, on the expedition to uh, the Naval Observatory, the station there. But they were down in the 150 meter range, and they just couldn't establish reliable communications. It wasn't going to happen. But Art, using um, 40 meters and 20 meters, could continue each evening to receive the updates from Reinhardt's. Art tells a funny story. If you look at our website over on the right side, you'll see something about uh, listen to Art Collins speak. And it's a speech where Reinhardt's has given um, some plaques and some awards, and Art is the guest speaker. And he uh, kids a lot about the fact that as the ship rocked back and forth, it would change the frequency that Reinhardt's was uh, operating on just a little bit. So Art had to ride the tuning dial and copy at the same time. But here's this young teenager, and he went down to the uh, Western Union downtown. He would get on his bicycle, ride downtown every evening, and send a collect telegram to the National Geographic Society, which was responsible for publishing all of the data about the expedition. And night after night after night, he was able to inform the world as to what was going on in this expedition. He became extremely famous for this. And Art was a good technician. He understood technology, um, but he really understood how to leverage relationships and how to market. And he was marketing himself. As you can see, this is August 2nd, 1925. 
So Art's 16 years old, not quite driving yet, and he's the one responsible for informing the world on this important Navy expedition. So uh, his father was extremely impressed with what was going on. Art got a lot of publicity. Uh, Radio Age was a popular uh, publication back in the time. You can see this was November of 1925. And uh, they highlight his work. And then he started writing um, various articles about radio, what was happening in radio, the technology of radio. And at the time, not only did you have to be licensed, but your shack had to be inspected by what later became the FCC. And one of the requirements was that the transmitter had to be link coupled to the antenna for safety reasons. And the inspector was uh, not thrilled with what he saw and Art technically explained to him why it was a link coupled transmitter and the inspector bought off on it and was quite impressed with young Art. Uh, this is another uh, excerpt from a publication from Radio Age. So Art was already in the process of expanding his publicity and he didn't know it yet, but starting to build the foundation for starting a company. So in 1931, Art Collins opens Collins Radio Company in the basement of his home, and he has one employee. You've got to remember what time this was in because we had the stock market crash and the 30s were the Great Depression. And his dad, M.H. Collins, had come pretty close to shutting everything down. Times were really, really tough. But he took the last of the family money and put it into this company that his young son was opening up to build transmitters. And that showed a lot of faith by M.H. Collins in his young son and his ability to both technically create and produce transmitters, but to um, sell them. And it was said that Art would build anything for anybody. Um, they incorporated in 1933 under the laws of Delaware, and the company moved into its first commercial space. Um, in 1934, Admiral Byrd remembered Art Collins, and he sailed um, to the South Pole in the Byrd Expedition, the Antarctic, Antarctic Expedition II. And he required that the ship be fitted with Collins transmitters. Uh, and he, his radio operators were designated to use these transmitters. The tra I have actually seen one of the one transmitter that's still um, in the Collins Museum in the Collins factory. And these things were bolted to pallets and set on the deck of the ships. The ships went down to the South Pole and they operated just fine. And this was beyond code. Actual voice trans transmissions were made in 1934 using Collins shortwave broadcasting stations back into the United States. This got our, a huge amount of publicity. In 1935, the factory portion of Collins moved to 7th Avenue in Cedar Rapids. 
But in 1936, RCA, Smirnoff, accused Collins Radio of patent infringement for the use of oscillator tubes in the Collins transmitters. Well, that just about shut the company down because without the ability to use normal oscillator circuits with tubes that were patented by RCA, they were pretty much toast. So Art designed his own vacuum tubes. I don't have any, but I've certainly seen a few of them. And included in the strangeness, um, some of the elements of the tube are on the outside of the vacuum envelope. He also redesigned uh, oscillator circuits and took advantage of some of the newest ideas in oscillator circuits. And he continued to create designs and sell radios, sell transmitters. Uh, they went to court. Part one, Smirnoff back down, and uh, they continued to use tubes and free from there. Um, the patent licenses were uh, secured from RCA and AT&T on uh, favorable terms, and um, they eventually built what is the first section of what's called the main plant in on uh, 35th Street in Cedar Rapids. Art supplied broadcast transmitters. He supplied transmitters to ham radio operators that were well handled. He supplied designs and sold patents to various companies uh, for them to create their own transmitters. He was not much in the receivers at the time. But Art became a pilot and was fascinated by aviation. And he supplied the radios to Pan Am and to Braniff. Well, this was very important to the success of Collins Radio. Uh, Art the transmitters at the time required a flight engineer to tune the radio, the transmitter, and dipping and loading a transmitter was not something that the airlines were crazy about. Now, RCA came up with their own version of the multi uh, multi-frequency transmitter, which was basically 10 transmitters and one big, huge, heavy box. And while it worked, the airlines weren't crazy about it because of its size and weight. So on a trip through Dallas where Art was flying, he sat down with the operations people at Braniff and they described the fact that they needed some type of way to hop frequencies without the need to have a trained radio operator in the cockpit. And Art got to thinking, and after dinner, literally on a, on a paper napkin, started coming up with the design idea for a mechanical tuner. And the mechanical tuner would be a multi-turn mechanical device that would stop at the same position every time and there would be 10 different stop points on this mechanical device. These mechanical devices would then be put into the transmitter to tune the frequency, plate tuning, plate loading, band switch, the various things that you needed to do to move from one frequency to the other. And 
he sold them, he sold Braniff and Pan Am on the idea and built some of these radios. And they were immediately successful and the airlines loved it. He patented that. He built a shop at the main plant that was a mechanical uh, plant. He hired a guy out of, I think, the University of Illinois. He was a mechanical design engineer who brought his team in. They bought a bunch of milling equipment and they started designing and improving these mechanical tuners. As a matter of fact, the TDO that sits in, you saw it's a big one that sits in the entrance to my shop, has those uh, early mechanical tuners in it. So everybody knew in the 30s, except for the American people, by the way, this is the plant uh, where the radios, the transmitters were built and sitting at the desk is M.H. Collins, his dad, and uh, he ran the business side of the company. Uh, this is one of the transmitters that went on the bird expedition. And I've actually uh, seen one, one surviving uh, transmitter. So the, um, Radio, the Navy Department came out with a request in the late 30s for a auto-tuned 10 frequency transmitter. And let's see if I can find the War Years presentation. And Art and his design team basically took the off the shelf components that they had and uh, designed a transmitter okay guys give me one second and I will find that it's embarrassing I thought I had it I had the post war years rather than the war years. Something like this only happens when you're in the midst of a presentation. Of course. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's downloading from Dropbox. Computers are our friends. I'm in the business and I used to like computers until I actually started. That's what I do for a living during the week. Yeah, it's, um, it can be painful. And Dropbox is not cooperating. No, it's not. And my internet has not been.
cooperating very much today. While these um, see if one of these will open up. So Art and his team came up with uh, what later became the ART-13. That one's downloaded. And yay. And they were scheduled to give a presentation to the Navy Department along with RCA. And the meeting was to be on a Monday morning, but the Navy Department had to cancel the meeting because it was scheduled for December 8th. Well, December 7th wasn't a good day for the United States. So the meeting was delayed a week, which actually showed how much importance they placed on the uh, need for this type of transmitter. They had already funded Collins Radio with enough money to build a giant plant in Cedar Rapids. And um, they, Art showed off his new toy and RCA showed off their toy. And the Navy was impressed technically with what could happen, what it would do. But they didn't trust this little company in Cedar Rapids run by a very young man with something so important. But the Brits were there and the British military that was there said, if you don't want it, we do. And we'll take every single one they can build. Well, the Navy uh, rethought about it and they handed the contract over to Art and Collins Radio. It was an enormous success. Art basically started building 24 seven. He employed everybody that he could in Cedar Rapids. He leased or bought every available building that could be had in Cedar Rapids. And they started producing radios. This is the gadget that was in the ART-13 that made this possible. These poles that come down from the top and catch these little things, this is what made this tuning, auto tuning possible. And they turned out to be very reliable. They are a pain to set up and get running the first time. But once you do, they'll operate over and over and over again. The change for the United States was enormous because in a fighter jet or in a bomber, if they wanted to move from one frequency, predetermined frequency to the other, there were 10 different frequencies they could hop. And they could just announce that they would go to frequency two or frequency eight. Everybody would hit the button. Everybody moved over to that other frequency. It was amazingly successful. And there was no way the pilot or the flight engineer or whomever on board the radio, aboard the airplane could do that. They proudly showcased their patented little device. And of course, this is way obsolete these days because auto tuning is done in a completely different way. And uh, radios these days, but at the time, it was incredibly innovative. This was the Collins 17F, which was the uh, 
basically built for Pan Am and, and Grand F and they sold a ton of it. So at the bottom, there's a picture of an ART-13. I'm sure most of you have seen in-person ART-13s. I've got a couple in my uh, World War II era. Um, the most famous use of that And when that light turns red, it's ready. So it's an incredibly, it's a Rube Goldberg invention, but it's, it works very well and it stood the test of time. They made tens of thousands of these and still were not able to keep up with the demand. So they farmed out production to other radio companies during the war. It's what put Collins Radio on the map, and what really shoved them towards being the leader in avionics, aircraft radios. This is, uh, I've forgotten Lonnie was in here. This is Lonnie Duncan. He was uh, with Collins Radio and then Rockwell Collins uh, when they uh, sold out. Uh, Bill Carnes can be seen on the right. I'm the one that took the picture. This is when the B-29 Fifi, uh, which is still flying, uh, is home based out of Dallas at Love Field. This is uh, when the AWA and the Cedar Rapids folks had restored the radio ring of Fifi to its pristine World War II condition. And Lonnie, uh, who passed away uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, was just a great guy, 90 years old, died of cancer, uh, really good friend of mine, and just a prince of a guy. Here he's showing off um, what had been done to the radio room. And I was there when it was dedicated uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There were a lot of uses for the ART-13. They were in the 18F Avenger, the PBY, the PBJ, the Curtis Helldiver, uh, the Martin Mariner, the B-29 Superfortress, the Lancaster Bomber. They were also used in submarines. They were used in destroyers. They were used in jeeps. They were used in small um, base stations uh, out in the field, and they had a 110 converter uh, for the ART-13, uh, normally powered by dynamoters. So it had use all over the military field. They had other radios that they had uh, that they used that they built none as prolific as the uh, ART-13, but the TCS was a great little field transmitter receiver. Uh, they were widely used in Jeeps and the Army used them all over the place. I've got a set of TCS uh, transmitters and receivers. Of course, the ART-13, and there's the various planes that it flew in. The TDO, which you saw, the giant 1,600-pound, 250-watt AM, 300-watt CW transmitter uh, with its remote control, and I have both those out in the front. There are only three surviving TDOs that we know of. Basically, it was a repackaged 18F, which they sold before the war, but was ruggedized. Now, the reason there aren't many left is the fact that they weighed 1,600 pounds and when the military got through with them, they either threw them in the ocean or they squashed them flat. They had no interest in trying to return them to the United States and restore them. 
There is one in the Dallas area that went through Tubba Hunter and that was uh, completely restored and it's the finest example known right now. Now, of the MDF, cute little radio, I've got one. It's a transmitter receiver that's close to the six meter band. It was built as a beach landing radio. It puts out a few watts, I think three watts of power. And the top area is the radio, the bottom area is for batteries and headset and crystals and things like that. Cute little radio, it was produced really too late to have any real impact in the war, but they were used post-war by harbor masters forever. Uh, they were light, they had a carrying handle on the top. Harbor master could walk up on the ship, put it in the uh, pallet house of the ship and talk back, uh, you know, only three watts of the spine around the harbor. Uh, they also designed and built a very secret uh, receiving system. And these were put all over England. Those that were, were around Collins Radio and Cedar Rapids noticed at the main plant there were little huts that went up. Uh, super secret project was going on. They had all sorts of military personnel that were armed that were wandering around protecting these huts. They were put all over England. They were radio direction finders linked to a common terminal in London where they, and they were used to search for submarine uh, broadcasts and pinpoint them so that they could go out and destroy the submarines. And uh, it was a very successful project and very, very top secret. The antennas were actually housed within the wooden structure. And Collins built, designed uh, this product for England. Cedar Rapids was a city of 62,000 people at the time. Collins Radio employed about 500 people and had 60,000 square foot of square feet of space. During the war, the workforce rose to over 3,000. And the company took up almost all the space available in the city. And they had about 200,000 square feet of production space and 100,000 square feet of admin and support space. They had over $50 million in government contracts. Uh, that was a lot of money back in the 40s, a ton of money. M.H. Collins, our, our father, ran the business side, Frank Davis, uh, general manager of design, Bill Barkley, executive VP of sales, Bob Gates, VP of finance, Morgan Kraft, director of operations, Finney, uh, general manager uh, of operations, and SW Storm. That was the management team. M.H. Collins fell ill in 1943 and died and it was a huge part of the company into art. He and his dad were incredibly close. That's a management meeting during the war um, at Collins Radio. And again, there's MH Collins with a very fancy phone on his desk. I hadn't really even noticed that before. This was uh, the factory before the war. Uh, they're building a uh, transmitter, Bill Corns has one, I forgot what the name of it is. Uh, they're very rare right now. This was the factory during the war. An interesting thing happened during the war. The men went off, able-bodied men went off to fight and join the military. The only way that they could keep production up was to hire women to work on the floor building radios. You can see at the top, there's a line and a table with women building radios and behind them, men building radios. The men didn't like it. 
They didn't want the women to encroach upon their factory space. So they set up women's lines and men's lines. The interesting thing is the women outproduced the men. This was an incredible societal shift for America. Rosie the Riveter is real. And in industries all across the United States, the women came in to work in the factories and build this giant industrial complex that won the war. Admiral Yamamoto, when he learned that the attack had been successful, but it was a complete surprise, said that he was concerned that he had awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve. Why? Because he had been to America and he had seen the vast mineral resources, the work ethic of the people, and the giant industrial capabilities uh, that Japan lacked. We also had a commodity which started the war, but that's a different story, and that's oil. We had all the oil that we could drag out of the ground. Japan had none. So, Art was incredibly successful during the war. He had uh, a burgeoning company, but in 1945, at the end of the war, the day, something happened. The government declared all the contracts null and void. Art Collins had a company with basically one customer, and that's the United States government. That customer was gone and he had no contracts. And he had an enormous overhead. They had seen this company coming. They had designed products to build after the war. It was a matter of shifting marketing resources and production resources over to marketing these new products. One of the products that they hit hard was the broadcast industry, and they were a leader in supplying broadcast transmitters, microphones, consoles, audio consoles, everything on the air side, speakers, everything needed to put a broadcast station together was available from the Collins catalog. They produced amateur radio equipment. They produced equipment for the airlines. Art designed the flight director system and avionics radar and other things for the uh, uh, aircraft industry. And he was extremely successful with it. But it was shifting from high production to low production, moving his team that his highest engineers moved down to the factory onto the line just so he could keep them employed. And then as he regrew the company, the Korean War started up again. The uh, company started back up in the business. Um, I always like to end the World War II story with a story about this man. This is his son. And uh, this is Fifi when we did the dedication of the Fifi radio room. And we did it in honor of Red, and I can't remember Red's last night. Um, let's do it here on his back. Uh, Red Irwin. This is a picture of Red Irwin after the war. He was a young radio man in a B-29 task at the end of the war with flying a mission over, a bombing mission over Japan. They were the lead airplane. And the lead airplane did not use their command sets when they were uh, on a bombing run or coming up to a bombing run for fear that they would be detected and pinpointed. They would use a series of flares that were shot out of the bottom of the airplane to direct the other bombers that were in their flight as to what to do. 
<laughs> when they were starting their bombing run, Red Irwin was directed to shoot out the first phosphorus flare. You lifted up the seat where the radio man sat, and it was supported by a tube with a top on it, a hinge top. And you put the appropriate colored flare on it. You slam the thing shut, hit a button, and the phosphorus flare shot at the bottom of the airplane telling the other airplanes what to do. That tube failed in Red Irwin's plane and that phosphorus flare popped up into the radio room. Now, in a B-29, there's a huge canopy where the pilot and the co-pilot sit. Below them is where the bombardier sit with an enormous glass canopy. There's a bulkhead wall and on the left side, the port side of the airplane is where the navigator would sit facing the front of the airplane. And he had a table that flipped over the doorway between the radio navigation area and the cockpit. The um, radio man sat on the starboard, the right side of the airplane, and he faced outward so that there, was, there were no windows. Right behind that was a bulkhead, and they, the rest of the airplane was devoted mainly to bombs, which were sitting there armed. And you had a phosphorus flare that was burning at an unbelievable temperature. And it filled the cockpit in that area with smoke, and it was going to catch the airplane on fire, and they were going to die. The other problem was that they were being strafed by zeros who were trying to shoot them down. Red Irwin did what they thought was impossible, and he picked up that burning flare. He started screaming at the co-pilot. The P-29 was a pressurized aircraft, and he started screaming at the co-pilot to open up the navigation window which was right behind the copilot. It was a little tiny window that they could use for sextant readings at night. And the copilot got that open and the whole thing was filled in this choking smoke. And Red Irwin ran into that flipped out table. He stuck the burning phosphorus flare under his arm, lifted up navigation table and threw the flare out side of the airplane. The wind sucked the remaining smoke out. Red Irwin fell on the floor and they thought he had died. They gave the command of the bombing run to one of the other aircrafts and they started heading back towards Guam. They radioed back as to what happened and uh, MacArthur heard the report of what had happened and he contacted the War Department, got an emergency authorization to award Red Irwin the highest honor available in the military. And you can see him wearing. They looked for one to give him because they knew he was going to die. They found the Medal of Honor. They found one in a museum in Pearl Harbor. They flew it out to Guam. MacArthur flew to Guam, and Red Irwin had survived, and he awarded him the Medal of Honor. He was the most highly decorated radio man in World War II. He went on to live after many, many, many operations, and you can see he had some scarring. But he went on to have a successful business career and really a nice life. But it's just a testimony to the bravery of the young men and women that fought World War II and uh, freed the world from the tyranny of the Axis powers. And it was just fun to be at that presentation where we dedicated that Fifi uh, radio room some years ago. 
to red or orange sun because red is cast away. And I'll leave you with a picture of the Collins factory and all of the women producing radio for the war effort. So if you're interested in war, I'll have to uh, come back at some point in time and talk about what happened after the uh, war years and some good and uh, some not so good. Um, company hit some very tough times. I'm trying to find where I can unscreen share. Oh, and here I'm back again. So that's it, but I'll take any questions and um, or comments. That was, I didn't know a lot of that early part of, of Collins. I was, that was fascinating. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of story that relates to our hobby afterwards. So we'll definitely have you back. But yeah, I mean, the, and I, I've seen articles on restoring some of those mechanical pieces. And it's, it's a, like a nightmare. It's beautiful clockwork stuff. But tearing one apart to restore it, cleaning it and putting it all back together is not for the faint of heart. It's not. And as a matter of fact, we, it requires a special gadget. Let's see if I can find one. Uh, it requires a special crank to, oh, here it is. It requires a special crank to align all of those tuners, and you have to back crank them and set them up a certain way. And we actually had a bunch of them produced. Um, and Bill Carnes um, had designed them from the original plans, and uh, he uh, kind of put them together himself, and we shipped them out. So. I've got several of them. If anybody ever has an ART-13 that they need to get Ronnie, um, I've got some of those cranks available. Very nice. We also right. have hmm. video instructions up on our website as to how to do it. Very cool. All right, anybody have any questions? <clears throat> Comments? Uh, no. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yep. Yeah, no questions. Uh, but I, I just want to say that was that was great. I, I really enjoyed that, and would love to see more. Uh, what happened after the war years? And uh, yeah, I learned something tonight that I didn't. I mean, I knew about Collins. Let's see, the post-war, I know a little bit about it, but uh, I, I I never knew about the beginnings of Collins, and that was that was a terrific story. Uh, some amazing stories. Uh, I want to hear more. Yeah. Okay. And it, this sort of thing is also fascinating too, because there's like companies that you've always known the name growing up, you know, like Ford, Chrysler, Boeing, and you just don't realize until you dig way back that there was a guy named Collins. There was a guy named Ford, a guy named Boeing who started the company. And uh, when you hear that sort of history, it, it's interesting that, you know, it, that uh, this, this brand name that you've known your whole life is actually some guy's name. So, yeah. You know, it takes vision and guts and risk and um, a lot of hard work and somebody that can build a team. Yep. And I've started a couple of companies over my lifetime, and it's a lot of work. And of course, never got the success that our columns did. But. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott. We appreciate your time this evening. And uh, we'll have this up on uh, my channel so the rest of the club that couldn't make it can watch. And uh, we'll be in touch. We'll definitely uh, get back. And at some point in time, I definitely would like to see the museum. I've, I've never been out that way. So. Well, it's not that far away from you, and 
if you need, if you want to get in, call me, email me. It's, it's not easy. Okay. But there, there's a way to get it done. Very cool. All right. Thank you very much. You You're have a good welcome. evening. And, Bye, uh, guys. All right. Good night. 73. 73. Yeah. All right. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, our next thing is going to be uh, in the, near the end of August. We're going to, uh, um, like I said, we're going to hopefully meet at Valparaiso University at Dan Brown's lab, and we're going to talk about satellite operation. And then by that point, my hope is that the Hampton Inn. Um, is done with the remodeling and they are still willing to uh, open up a room to us on uh, on a Friday evening to uh, start meeting in person again. So um, Joe did mention, because we had a, a fairly successful field day out at Joe's place, and he did mention the fall field day, which is um, like six meters VHF and UHF. And uh, he'd like... Uh, like to see if we can set up and try that, which I'm all for. So uh, we'll see what goes on there. So, all right, everybody, if you got nothing else, thank you for showing up. And uh, I've got a few more. I'm going to try to get a few more from the past that I'm, I'm going to try to get put up on YouTube tonight. And then I'll send out a thing to the email list. And uh, those that missed it can catch up. So good night. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome.